Hello, everyone. Uh, I'll talk about Next Browser today. So I'm part of an Atlas engineer. We've been working on uh, this browser for the last two years, something. And uh, we try to look at uh, the world of browsers a bit differently. So we've been a little bit frustrated with uh, the popular browsers like Firefox and Chrome, or the more geeky browsers that allow us to be tinkering with the configuration and all. So uh, personally, when I use Firefox or Chrome, uh, what frustrates me a little bit is that I, I, can't, I feel a bit uh, imprisoned. I feel like I cannot do much configure. Uh, it's a little bit like uh, this black box, or more or less. Uh, you could argue that, okay, there are extensions, but those extensions really are limited. They don't really, you can't access the internals of the browser. Uh, they can't really communicate so much between each other, and they can't really communicate with your system. So if you want to um, interact with Git or your text editor, you can't really do that very well. Uh, it's not easy. So um, there's that, and then uh, other uh, smaller browsers, uh, been tailoring to the more geeky crowds, um, and those are usually keyboard focused, minimalist. Uh, you can configure them with uh, in Python or different languages. Uh, and those browsers, well, they, there are so many of them actually, they are legions. And I've been wondering, I mean, why actually uh, do they come and go so fast? Uh, and I think the problem here is uh, a lack of abstraction with regard to the renderer. And really, I think the, what a web browser truly is, it's a user interface. Uh, it's a user experience that allows us to interact with the web, with the content, but it's not, uh, it shouldn't really be stuck to the web render itself. So we don't really, I mean, it matters, of course, but maybe it's not all that matters for a browser. So that's what we've been trying to do with Next Browser. So the, the, the key uh, design decisions that we've taken here is one, to decouple the browser from the web renderer. That means that we support uh, WebKit and uh, Web Engine, which is uh, more or less blank, Chrome. And on the other hand, we also try hard to make it extremely configurable, uh, because I'm a geek and I like to configure my browser uh, to, to the very core, and I like to, to make it to have full control over my browser. So how do we do that? Uh, how do we have a fully customizable program uh, where we don't only expose an API to the user, we give the program, the whole program to the user so that they can do whatever they want with it. And I think for that we need the right programming language. That means the language is fully introspectable, that's fully, uh, that can be fully molded around. Uh, and I think a good, good um, uh, the, the right, uh, maybe the right language here is a uh, language from the Lisp family because uh, those languages are extremely powerful in that sense, so very introspectable. So we chose common Lisp here. And um, well, that's enough with the details. Now I would just, uh, I'm just going to show you some demos and well, you will see for yourself. So this is a, um, no, it doesn't matter, I will explain later. So if I can start a browser, okay, here, there I go. Um, so first of all, it's well, really barren. But uh, what I want to show is this area here, which is uh, a little bit similar to, and oops. <laughs> Ding, wait. Uh, okay, sorry about that. Okay, sorry. So um, first thing is that we, by default we don't show tabs, but instead we use a, an approach that's used by Emacs in particular, we list all the tabs, or that we call buffers, and uh, what's cool about that is that we can search them. So if I write wiki and uh, geeks, I can fuzzy search my tab and go directly to the GNU geeks Wikipedia page. And we can extend this concept of what we call the mini buffer, or like the address bar essentially in a browser, to actually do this for everything. For instance, uh, say I'm browsing here and I see there is this uh, um, table of contents here, I can actually browse it the same way. So if I go roll back, enter, and I'm directly at the rollback section. So we can actually use the, this concept, this fuzzy search concept everywhere. 
So that's pretty cool. You can even use it to interact with the browser itself. For instance, how many times have you found yourself with so many tabs you, you were really lost with them? And you wanted to, okay, let's kill just a bunch of Wikipedia pages you don't need. So then I can just start deleting my buffers. I can narrow them down to wiki, select them all, enter, and they are gone. So that's much more productive, right? And it's a very simple concept. And when you start using it everywhere, well, it starts becoming pretty cool. So uh, that's essentially the basics for the UI or the UX. Um, but as I mentioned before, it's written in common list, which means that you can leverage the language to hack it. And I mean by that, program every single part of it live. So for instance, here I go back to my repo, where I can evaluate code. So if I evaluate the function current buffer, I get an object here, which I can start introspecting. And here I get, this is a slime, a slime for command list. This is an introspection window where I get all the details, like the title or the URL, etc. cetera. Um, and if I go back to my buffer, I can start calling functions. Uh, I can say, say, set URL, and let's go to my website, and there, it works. Um, now we can start doing more sophisticated things, like I can define a function. So I'm going to copy paste it, it's gonna be easier. And, um, Wait, um, sorry, where is it? Um, oh, sorry. Okay, there. So I copy paste this. Okay, there. So this is essentially a, a command that will repeat what I just did. Uh, I want to delete all wiki buffers. Say I, I keep doing this all over again, all the time. Um, well, maybe I want to write a function that will essentially uh, loop over all buffers, match all those that match Wikipedia, and delete them all. So if I evaluate this, and I go back to my next window, and here this is the list of all commands I have at my disposal. If I start fuzzy searching delete wiki, there it is. And well, it's double, and it's long story. Oh, sorry about that. So, um, and I can call it, or I can actually do even better. I can bind it to a key, um, and if I do this, I can evaluate code even from within Next. You don't need an extra setup, that doesn't matter. So if I do command evaluate and I evaluate this here, there, so I evaluated the form. Now I open a new Wikipedia window, first them, and I've deleted all the wiki, I'm just pressing the right key binding, I've rerun the command again. So I've essentially hacked the browser while it was running, I defined a function, I bound it to a key, but you can do everything. You have full access to, to the entire internals. Um, it goes uh, a long way to, um, uh, down this road uh, when you can start extending stuff. For instance, you can uh, easily call to the OS uh, components. Uh, if you want to hook onto Git, uh, it's very easy to you go on your uh, whatever GitHub page, uh, let's say this one, and here, if I call the command VCS clone, I've cloned a repository to my favorite, uh, uh, to my local project directory. Uh, it's very convenient. Uh, we would like to extend this a little more so that it actually updates the page at the same time to show you that you've cloned it, stuff like that. Um, beyond that, uh, uh, we've also, uh, passwords, man what about password managers? I mean, they're really useful. I like to have a password manager integrated to my browser, it's best for security. Uh, very convenient, so we've also simply wrote a bridge to keypass XE and our password store, and depending what you got installed, you can just pray copy password, and you browse here, and first them, and then you get your password, and you can paste it. Um, then next, I mean, I can go on and on. Uh, let's say bookmarks. Uh, so if I want to open my bookmarks, I can also fuzzy, fuzzy search them and I can match against some tags. So if you look at the, uh, at the end of the lines here, the, the end of the candidates, uh, if I want to match, say, against uh, geeks and fast or crypto, I can start writing complex expressions, like, um, sorry, um, and geeks, fast, crypto, and as soon as I close the parenthesis, 
that match exactly those two types of bookmarks. Uh, one that has fossil and geeks, the other one has crypto. So imagine you have thousands of bookmarks. You can have extremely powerful um, match, uh, tag matching from within a browser. Um, what else? So what about, um, let's go back to, let's go to Tor. And if I go here, I'll start browsing. So I go to the anonymity network and I want to go on uh, the main page. Okay. So I go there, I start browsing and go to documentation. Then I realize, all right, uh, I want to go back. I want to go back to the Wikipedia page. So I go back to the history and go back to Tor. Um, now I'm going down a few more links. And at this point, I, if I go back again and forward again, well, uh, I've rewritten the history. I don't have access to the first branch of the history, which was the Tor website. But here we're a bit smarter. We, we, we try to store everything. We, start to, we try to store the whole tree of history. So we can essentially go, sorry, history, tree, and there. I can actually display the whole history of all the links I've browsed and in a very, well, tree fashion, which is pretty cool, right? So, yeah, a few more examples. Um, I think, well, I think I've showed a lot of things already. Oh, bookmarks, yeah. So if you like Emacs, maybe you like org mode, there's something else you can do is uh, go to your favorite website and if you want to, in bookmark this uh, link into your te te text editor as an org entry. I've written uh, very small functions for it. And there, I can capture the link, and this will be stored with the right title and the right link in my org agenda. So here, I've actually essentially wrote a function to communicate with the outer world by passing code around, which is quite amazing. I'm passing Lisp to an external process, and this is just uh, one function. It's really trivial. That's the, the kind of power we can get when we choose the right language, I believe. So that would be it for the demo. And uh, well, I hope you enjoyed it. We have a few minutes for the questions. So thank you very much. So you mentioned um, there was a password manager integration for KeyPass XE and uh, some other. Is there also password store? Yeah. Um, a, is there also password manager integration for Bitwarden? For Bitwarden? Uh, I can't hear you. Uh, is there also uh, integration for the password manager Bitwarden? Um, uh, Oh, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, I mean, of course. Uh, so the question is, can we have um, integration with more password managers? And uh, of course, uh, really that's, that's the whole point is that it's really easy to, to uh, integrate with all sorts of external processes. Um, and when it comes to the password manager, we wrote a, this uh, virtual interface and you can essentially connect to it and then you get everything uh, for, for free. Yeah. Can, the, can the language be used to, uh, to um, control the page itself, like uh, automation similar to what Selenium would do? Like? Like Selenium. So automating within the page, find the second link, click on that, and then fill in the text box, and then click the submit button. Can you do that kind of thing within yeah. the language? So um, what really, you can leverage the web renderer to send any sort of JavaScript that you want. And uh, what's also pretty neat is that with uh, a language like Lisp, you can have, maybe you know, you've heard of Clojure script. Uh, Common Lisp has the equivalent called parent script. So it amounts to, it compiles Lisp on the fly to JavaScript and sends it to the browser. So you can start compiling everything in Lisp, but actually interact with the web page. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, is there a way for, to exchange extensions because there are quite a security risk since they have access to a file system, don't they? So, yeah. So have you, I'm sure you've thought about it, but how do you exchange extensions and make sure that they're secure? 
you mean, uh, so the question is, uh, so last question. The question is, is uh, how do we make sure that ex extensions can be exchanged and are secure? So you mean uh, third party extensions? Yeah. So this, the answer is very simple for now. Uh, we don't have third party extensions. Uh, but in the future, of course, we want something uh, very robust here. Um, I mean, I personally work with uh, Geeks Package Manager, which uh, provides a lot of security here. So that could be, we could leverage this uh, package manager to, to, provide, to do distribute extensions. That gives, you, gives us a lot of guarantees, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>